This year, Northern Ireland is 100 years old. It is spending its centenary year, as it has spent so many others, mired in tension. For the sad truth about this corner of the United Kingdom is that the threat of violence, the threat of a return of violence, hangs over us always. And for the last seven nights now, that threat has been realised. As political leaders, we must stand united in appealing to The Assembly met today to denounce what we've seen these last seven nights. But to understand where these last seven nights have come from, you have to understand a longer story, one rooted in a crisis in loyalism. Ever since 1998, there have been elements of loyalism that have been disaffected uh, by what they see as a peace process uh, that has delivered for Republicans, but has largely left them behind. Now, I don't agree with that. I think unionism and loyalism you know, has made many gains uh, out of the 1998 agreement, but there is a perception within loyalism uh, that it's all going in the other direction. Um, added to that, you have the decision last week, uh, and this is not a judgment by me at all, uh, but the decision by the uh, Public Prosecution Service uh, not to go ahead with um, uh, prosecutions of uh, leading Sinn Féin figures for alleged breaches of COVID regulations uh, at the uh, funeral of Bobby Story last year. And so you've got a sort of toxic mix which has kind of all come together at once. But then add to this chronic sense of inequity the more acute grievance over the Northern Ireland Protocol, the imposition of a border between NI and GB, and you understand why things have deteriorated so quickly. There are other factors, like discontent over police crackdowns on paramilitary gangs, but the big picture is clear. It isn't only about Brexit, but it is impossible to understand without it. In terms of what happens now, Westminster politicians are clear they want a return to the political process. But there are three problems with that. The first relates to the DUP's lessened position in the eyes of many loyalists, the odd balancing act it must now perform, and the tension inherent within it. The difficulty the DUP have now in relation to the protocol is that while they stay maintain the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Northern Ireland Executive, they have to implement the protocol. So the DUP are stuck in this situation whereby on one hand they're saying that the protocol essentially undermines the very fabric of the union, which is at the core of our identity, but on the other hand that they are part of an executive and assembly which is implementing the protocol. So you can't be a, an opponent of the protocol and an implementer of the protocol at the same time. And that is why I think that we're naturally going to see political instability because you probably have different sections of the DUP, more hardline sections of the DUP who would pull down the institutions tomorrow. Second, insofar as British governments and British prime ministers have ever been trusted by loyalists, this one is held in especially low stead, not least because of the promises he once made. I want to make it absolutely clear that under no circumstances, under no circumstances, uh, whatever happens, uh, will there be, I, will I allow the EU or anyone else to create any kind of division down the Irish Sea. And third, the practicalities. Let us, for a moment, suppose that Boris Johnson did as the loyalists would like him to do and jettison the protocol wholesale. Well, what that would do is eviscerate his relationship with the European Union and the Republic. It would likely damage an already enfeebled UK economy and likely also inflame tensions on the other side of the ledger. It's possible that you would have nationalists taking to the streets. The simple fact of the matter is the particular form of Brexit that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson chose has, as predicted, destabilised the politics of Northern Ireland and there isn't an obvious way of writing it again. What we need now in relation to the protocol is um, there are two options basically. One is that the UK seeks a much softer, closer relationship with the EU. Sadly, Boris Johnson looks like he's not going to pursue that. He's that he's going to refuse to do that. I can't see how he will make that uh, make that move. That would be good for the whole UK. The other option is to seek a more constructive relationship with the EU in terms of making the protocol work, addressing individual issues as they come up and making a joint commitment to making the protocol work for everyone in Northern Ireland. 
To make that work, the EU will need to bend as well, something about which we hear far less. But even with every practical step possible, the theory of the new border will endure. That alone may mean discontent endures as well. It would hardly be the first time in Northern Ireland's history that principle mattered most. Lewis Goodall, well, we invited the government on the programme tonight, but they declined. But I am joined by the Conservative MP, Theresa Villiers, who was Northern Ireland's secretary for four years until 2016 and supported Brexit at the referendum. Good evening, Theresa Villiers. Good evening. When you were Northern Ireland's secretary, you described claims uh, that Brexit would throw up barriers and destabilise the peace process as scaremongering of the worst and most irresponsible kind. Should you eat your words tonight? I believe that the commitment of the vast majority of people to exclusively peaceful means to determine their future is rock solid. I do not believe that the peace process is in jeopardy. It's a, it's a depressing fact that rioting and lawlessness of the kind we've seen on the streets over recent days is something that's disfigured Northern Ireland over decades. We need a robust police response to it, but um, you know, references back to Brexit are not an excuse for these rioters. Nothing justifies what they're doing. And, of course, Brexit is only part of the problem. But then let's just take you back to what Boris Johnson said. He said to Northern Ireland businessmen on film that if they were to receive customs declarations, they could, them direct, they could put them directly in the bin. If you think that what the Prime Minister says matters, that wasn't true. And surely to say that, given what's happened, was a huge error of judgment. And now we see the reality on the ground. Surely the Prime Minister has to stand by his words, repeated more than once, and they've been found not to be true. Well, the, the Prime Minister and Lord Frost are doing everything they can to make the protocol work. It was a difficult compromise. They made a promise. They, have to agree. they made a promise. They made a promise that if you got a customs declaration as a Northern Ireland business person, you could put it in the bin. It would mean nothing. Was that wrong to do that? And, and what they're doing now is to try to find a way to deal with the frictions which have arisen under the protocol. The, the problem is particularly acute in relation to food, but there are solutions. An obvious one is, is the protocol already provides that if your goods are not at risk of going into the single market, i.e. down south, then customs formalities don't apply in the same way. They just need to apply that principle to food-related checks, which would be an entirely proportionate approach, a risk-based approach, because we have some of the highest food safety standards in the world. There is no need for the excessive paperwork that the EU wants to impose. But, but, but the fact is that there is... But the fact is, a border does exist. Last month, though, you said now the protocol does have potential to create serious political instability. You recognise that as a former Northern Ireland secretary. You recognise that it had the potential to create serious political instability. It does, yes. I'm not understating the problems caused by the protocol. I, in the longer term, I want to see it replaced altogether so that we no longer have a situation where Northern Ireland is stuck in single market rules without a say over them. So but you, want to, re, you want a reworking of the, you, you like a reworking of the, 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 the deal on yes. Northern Ireland? Yes, but I, I accept that that's unlikely to happen in the right. short term, so, which is why we need to negotiate the fixes to deal with the worst but, of the frictions. And I, I believe they are deliverable, not least because when it comes to food and other border-related checks, <clears throat> the EU is an under an obligation to take so, a proportionate approach, an evidence-based approach, which they're not in imposing the full panoply of SPS checks on food going into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Well, let's look at the broader picture in Northern Ireland. And today, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church said, in, and this is across across Northern Ireland, there is a growing sense of hopelessness, a lack of economic progress, reduced opportunity for employment and educational disadvantage. In a way, politics has entirely failed Northern Ireland. Well, Northern Ireland has, has progressed massively in the, uh, in the two decades since the Belfast Agreement. Huge progress has been made. There's been a lot of economic success. Clearly, the COVID disaster will have had a huge impact 
but but clearly there is much work to be done to build resilience in the communities where we're seeing this rioting take place and to break the hold that these criminal gangs that label themselves as loyalist paramilitaries to break the hold they have over these communities because that influence is part of the problems we're seeing manifested on the streets at the moment. But the other fundamental problem, and we see it, and we've seen it over the last seven days, I just take you to, you know, it's the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement in two years' time. And the deal was, under the Good Friday Agreement, the target was to remove the peace walls. You know, the peace walls, if anything, are even more entrenched than they were. The peace walls have been uh, pushed forward and pushed back and put up again tonight. Do you actually think the peace walls are going to come down in the next two years? Do you? No, I, I don't think they'll come down in the next two years. It, it is, it's, it's still a, it's sadly the case that these communities want, in many cases, these, these interface barriers to stay up. But I fully agree that there is much more work to be done to build a, a genuinely shared society and break down sectarian divisions. They, they've never gone away, but we shouldn't lose sight of the tremendous success that's been delivered by the devolved settlement agreed under the Good Friday Agreement. It has created huge new opportunities for Northern Ireland. It's transformed life for the better. Thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight, Theresa Villiers. Well, of the 10 people arrested in recent days, some were as young as 13. So what's led to this? I'm joined now by Maria Cahill, a former SDLP politician and political commentator from a nationalist background, and Andrew McCormick, a community worker in the unionist areas of East Belfast. Good evening to both of you. Uh, Maria Cahill, tell me where you think the deepest problems over integration lie. I think we have a number of problems and I think part of the interview there that you did with Theresa Villiers actually has exa or explains it a bit because while she's pontificating around the protocol, part of Belfast is burning tonight and it is mostly young children, as you say, who are involved in it. And I think part of the difficulty that we have is to try and ensure that that cycle of sectarianism isn't exacerbated through a political failure here. And one of the difficulties is that those children I mean, to quote W.B. Yeats, peace has come dropping mm -hmm. slow for them because they are caught in a cycle. Some of them are third generation unemployed. They're living in an area of multiple deprivation. In fact, the area that you see a lot of the rioting on over the last two nights, for example, the Springfield and the Shankill, mm -hmm. it ranks number one in an area of multiple deprivation in terms of educational skills and an unemployment. So what we need to do, and I think everybody in Northern Ireland has a responsibility in this, is to look collectively at a strategy from birth right through a possibly 20 year strategy in terms of wraparound services so that we can start to deal with those problems of poverty and exclusion and also aggression because we have a cycle of aggression yeah. in this society but too and every time there is a political vacuum this gets exacerbated and in terms of integration Kirsty, you know it is a huge problem yeah. in the fact that we have peace walls still almost 25 years in this peace agreement would indicate to you that there's a serious problem here. Andrew McCormick, do you think this is spontaneous anger or do you think it's been coerced and exploited by different groups? I mean, these are kids as young as 13. Yeah, Kirsty, no one wants to see what we're currently seeing, um, but we need to understand that these issues have been simmering for nearly 20 years and anyone who are surprised by the mm. images that we have seen over the past week um, are only surprised because they have repeatedly failed to listen to the concerns of the unionist uh, and loyalist community. Uh, and while the ink was still wet on the Belfast Agreement or the Good Friday Agreement, uh, there has been a concreted effort to subdue the loyalist community. Uh, and the community has been vilified. They have been demonised at every opportunity. Uh, and a big thing of the Belfast Agreement was Strand 15D. And this is not just a clause or, or a mechanism that we talk about, but this essentially is a promise. Uh, and this was a promise that was made um, by all that no key decisions for Northern Ireland will be made without the consent mm -hmm. for, of the other community. It was a promise to always listen to each other and that we will not ever return to simple majority where the majority mm -hmm. rules but the day. It was a promise to always to listen, but this promise has been broken. It's been broken time and time mm -hmm. again to the point where the question is not why are loyalists dropping their support for the agreement? The question should be is why would loyalists support this agreement now in its current form?
So but in, in, a, in a way, what you've got is you've got, you're saying, why would loyalists support this agreement in its current form? And you've also the nationalists, who, you know, the majority of whom voted for Remain, saying, why should we support it either? So in a sense, nobody is happy in Northern Ireland. And the ones that are really suffering from this are children. And so what do you think, Andrew, is the best way to get children over the sectarian divide? Well, the best way forward uh, has to be engaging these young people, first of all, in education, because as Maria yeah. rightly points out, um, the educational underachievement, in, and especially in loyalist and working class areas right across Northern Ireland, is, is of the worst of the, in the entirety of the United Kingdom. So we need to look at education. We need to get these young people involved in education. We need to get them more GCSEs, more levels to yeah. improve the job opportunities so, so, that so, are out there. And so, second of all, we need to get them involved in, in politicising. Yeah. We need to politicise well, well, let me, well, let, me just, let me continue. Before we talk about politicising, well, let's uh, talk about what was, uh, Maria, and you'll remember this title, the Cohesion Sharing and Integration Document that every child in Northern Ireland was going to be paired with a child from another community. Every child. That was part of the deal. What happened? Well, it didn't work because people didn't want it to work. And I think it's very dangerous to talk around, you know, what should we do just within the loyalist community? There's mm -hmm. rioting on both mm -hmm. sides mm -hmm. of the peace line tonight. And in terms mm -hmm. of children, the exploitation of children over the last week has been an absolute disgrace. So in yeah. some cases, adults are sending them out to riot, and in other cases, they're standing back and watching them. And what we need to do, why would, you, would a young person believe that they have a future here in Northern Ireland when all we do as adults is bicker and fight among mm. ourselves? And I know that sounds very twee to say, Kirsty, but it's actually yeah. really important and I wonder, we Maria, need to valued. I wonder, Maria, you know, it, what we see in the streets tonight, it only takes a stray firework. It only takes, you know, a, a petrol bomb for a child to be killed. So presumably de-escalation as soon as possible has got to be the goal. Absolutely. And I note with regret that the Loyalist Community Council, which is the paramilitary umbrella group that engages and, and negotiates in some cases with the British government and with the Northern Irish and the NIO, um, have actually failed to condemn this at all. And I think mm -hmm. it's incumbent upon them if they really, really care about children in their community and having a better future, they need to join the rest of us in terms of condemning it. And Andrew McCormick, how do you, how do you get over to families in loyalist areas that their children are actually in danger? And that's that's first part of the question. But secondly, a future in Northern Ireland where all politics is not delineated along sectarian lines would surely be a good one. Yeah, there, there's lots of things that I would love to change about this country. Uh, mm. And, you know, it must be said that I would love nothing more than, than to see peace progress. Um, but currently there's massive political and cultural alienation. Mm. Uh, and I'm not condoning or, or justifying the behaviour of young people engaged in riotous behaviour. Quite the opposite. Um, but part of the problem is that they've watched and learned that violence or the threat of it has often paid off. Uh, and we need not to demonise, but to humanise these young right. people. We need to see um, the the anger and the deep hurt um, that these young people are experiencing. And historically, they have watched parades rerouted or stopped because of violent protest or uh, fear. Yeah, and, and, this, and this seen is, right down I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you there because you know we could definitely do this for another ten minutes. But thank you very much indeed.